Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar with Dr. Juliana Rangel. My name is Pat Bono, president of New York Bee Wellness, which is an independent educational grassroots charitable 501c3 non-membership organization. Its mission is to educate small scale, sideliner, and beginning beekeepers. We do have a YouTube site with past in-person and online presentations. New York Bee Wellness also sends out newsletters several times a year. We conduct statewide surveys twice a year for non-migratory beekeepers in New York State. Okay, well, welcome, Dr. Rangel. I'm glad to have, to have, have you present, thank you. Thank you very much. So, hi everyone, thank you for inviting me to present to the New York Bee Wellness uh, group. Um, I've never presented to this group, so I'm happy to be here. And I was asked by Pat to talk about queen management essentials. So that's what we'll be doing today. But before I move on, I wanna say that um, I am Associate Professor of Apiculture in the Department of uh, Entomology at Texas A&M University, which is located in the city of College Station about uh, an hour and a half northeast of um, uh, Houston, just in case you don't know where that is. So queen management essentials, we're going to be talking about how we can maintain queen quality and how to look for potential issues that are causing our colonies and or queens to fail. So we'll go over different factors that affect um, queen quality one at a time. So we'll start today with, oh, I think I skipped, oh no. It, it'll, it'll add up. So we're gonna talk about the, um, how genetics affect queen quality, how uh, the conditions uh, for mating with suitable drones affect queen quality, how the age and the vigor uh, needs to be kept and um, kept back off in your colonies, because as you will see, um, uh, we'll show some data on why aging makes queens um, of worse quality. We'll also talk about the effects, a little bit of the effects of pesticides on queen quality, but not so much because I have a whole talk on that topic and I, um, I'm not gonna go over that in too much detail today. Um, pathogens, parasites in particular, the varroa mite, um, nutrition or, or poor nutrition in particular, habitat fragmentation and how it may affect colony health and therefore um, queen health, changing weather patterns. And lastly, uh, I always leave that one as our own beekeeping practices and how they affect the quality of the queens that um, head our colony. So I'm gonna go over each one of these rubrics um, um, at a time and that's what we'll focus on today. So let's start with uh, genetics. When we discuss the, um, how genetics affect colony health, uh, we need to focus on several things that happen within colonies and the genetics of the queen and her drone partners. So the first thing is the genetic strain. So what is the strain of the queen that we um, want in our colonies or the, uh, some people call it the race. Um, it can be a mix of different subspecies. It can be Apis mellifera mellifera um, mixed with Apis mellifera scutellata, which is the um, Africanized hybrid, or with um, Apis mellifera ligustica, the Italian queen. So we have because of different strains that we can have in our colony. We also have to look at the genetic diversity of her parents. Uh, so it's not just her mating uh, diversity, but also the genetic diversity of her mom and dad, the type of breeding paradigm that she may have come from if she comes from a commercial queen producer, and the degree of inbreeding in the colony. And in particular, inbreeding can be a huge problem in areas where they might, the colonies may be few and far between and they're isolated. Um, and there's not a whole lot of diversity to um, get drawn from. 
So one of the issues with uh, looking at the degree of inbreeding in a colony is that genetic diversity avoids inbreeding problems, uh, which can cause the production of diploid drones in a colony. So I'm gonna go over uh, the production of diploid drone and what it, it, it means for honeybee colonies. So honeybee colonies, sex is determined by one particular gene, very interesting um, sex determination system. So we know that um, honeybees are haplodiploid, meaning that um, drones from, from unfertilized eggs, and so they are haploid, they only have one set of chromosomes, and females come from fertilized eggs that are diploid, that means they have two sets of chromosomes, one from the father and one from the mother. And so we, we're, we're aware of the haplodiploidy sex determination system, but you may not be aware of another very important component of how sex is determined in, uh, in honeybees. And that is that um, sex is determined by a sex determinant gene, it's called the CSD or um, CSD gene, um, which has 15 different alleles or can you, call, you can call them variants or flavors. So one gene on one chromosome that can have different flavors. And so a, each drill, because they only have one set of chromosomes, they only have one allele at that sex determining locus, whereas queens have two um, alleles of the, at the sex determining locus. They have one that they get from their mom and one that they get from their dad. So we know that if the egg is unfertilized, an individual has only one allele at the sex determining locus. If it is fertilized, it has two alleles and it can be either the same copy or the same variant. And that means that that individual is known as homozygous at the sex determining locus. And the bee turns into a diploid female, which is the vast majority of workers that we see in the colony, 99.999%. But if the alleles, um, sorry, if they're different, I, I misspoke. If the alleles are different at the sex determining locus, meaning that the individual is heterozygous at the sex determining locus, that individual bee turns into a diploid female, the vast majority. If the alleles are the same, the bee turns into a diploid drone because they are homozygous at the sex determining locus. So let me give another example. Imagine that this um, queen, for this example, as I said, she has two alleles at the sex determining locus. Let's call them a, allele A and allele B. You can call them allele yellow and allele blue, or uh, one and two, whatever you want to call it. Or potentially, um, or uh, I don't know, a yellow or something like that, but just two different flavors of at the sex determining locus. And she goes out and mates, and she mates with five drones. Just randomly, she goes out and she mates with five drones. Each one of these drones has a specific allele of the sex determining locus. Just so happens that she made it with two drones that have the B allele, one that has the A allele, one that has the C allele, and the other one that has the D allele. So what you immediately notice is that her offspring that are diploid, meaning two sets of chromosomes uh, that come from drone A or the drone that has allele A will share the same allele at the sex determining locus because she has half of her offspring are gonna be uh, having the allele A and the other uh, half of the offspring are gonna have allele B. That means that this individual here is gonna be homozygous at the sex determining locus. And if you see this here, it will mean that if they have the same allele, it's gonna turn into a diploid drone, which is not a viable individual. They get removed by workers really quickly um, before they even emerge. Um, experimentally, if you allow these diploid drones to emerge, uh, they look completely albino and they're not viable. They, are, uh, they, they die before they can reach sexual maturity. But if, um, if um, because she made it with allele A, she, the other half of her offspring have uh, her allele B, that means that half of that offspring that comes from that father 
are okay because they're heterozygous. They have different alleles um, uh, when they're diploid. So they're, this individual is going to turn into a worker, no problem. Uh, with B, the thing flips. So half of these offspring that are homozygous are going to end up being diploid drones. And because you made it with another drone that had that allele B, the same problem is going to arise here. So quickly, you see that the more drones that you mate with that have either allele A or allele B at the sexus hormone locus, the more chances she's going to have of having diploid offspring that are homozygous at the sexus hormone locus. Whereas if she only made it with individuals that have allele C through um, whatever P genus, so whatever letter, maybe M or P or something like that, then there will never be a chance that she has um, homozygous um, individuals that are diploid. Therefore, all of her offspring are gonna be uh, female. So again, inbreeding causes a high chance of diploid bees having the same alleles as the sex determining locus, and those diploid drones are not viable. So when you have, um, and, and I should mention for, for this talk, we're trying to play detective of all the potential issues that can be going on in your colony and why your queens or your colony are not being as productive as possible. If you find a pattern like this in your colony and you actually did all their diagnostic tests and it's not like you have um, your being you know, foul brood or chalk brood, um, if, if your brood are normal looking, but you have a lot of these open holes, open cells, not a very red and even pattern um, in the brood nest area. It might be that you have a queen that is inbred. She shares her um, alleles of the sex determining locus with many of her drone partners, and therefore the workers remove those drones from the cells before they even emerge. And so this is what we call the shut brood pattern. And that's a telling sign that your queen is inbred, in which case you want to replace her with a new one. And you also, of course, want to find out the real root of the problem of why you have inbreeding. It might be because um, if you own the drone source colonies, they might be genetically related, related to where those queens came from, or you basically by random chance um, have genetic material uh, in the areas where the queen mates that is very similar to your queen source colony or your mating move. Okay, so mating conditions also have a lot to do with queen quality. Um, you need to be aware that queens require at least 12 to 15 drones to be fully mated uh, per virgin queen. And so quickly, if you're doing any kind of clearing um, for your um, a beekeeping club, or if you're becoming a sideline or queen producer, you have to have plenty of drone source colonies that can um, suffice the need for drones during mating for these virgin queens. And again, they have to be different, genetically different enough that you're not going to have inbreeding problems. So you want to pay attention to the queen's natural mating conditions and act accordingly. You have to plan ahead. So are there enough drones in the area during spring split time? or during the full requeening replacement time. So many um, times in our early spring, uh, people get really eager to wanna produce drones, uh, sorry, queens, because of course, uh, the quicker you have a queen um, laying eggs, the, the, the better for either your queen rearing operation or for splitting your colonies or requeening your colonies, but you may not have paid attention to the fact that there are no sexually mature drones. So uh, you want to know what the quality and the breed of your drone source colony is. So um, drones need at least 15 to 18 days post-emergence to be uh, sexually mature. The book says that it's about 10 days post-emergence. I would argue based on our work that that's the low end, uh, the very extreme um, low end of the bar. Our work and that of others have shown that um, uh, drone sexual competitiveness and um, maturity peak at around 
18 to 22 days post-emergence. So again, those early queens may not um, be able to find drones that have been around for at least 15 days so that they can provide an ejaculate that queens uh, can receive upon population. Another thing that our work has shown is that um, if drones are reared in wax or comb that has been repeatedly contaminated with pesticides, then their development is impaired. And when they emerge and then reach sexual maturity, the um, viability of the sperm in those uh, drones is severely compromised. So the queen may potentially be finding suitable drones instead of in terms of age, but upon copulation, she's receiving a portion of those drone sperm that's actually not viable and cannot fertilize an egg, which means that she has, um, she's gonna run out of sperm prematurely, or at least of sperm that can fertilize eggs. The age and the vigor of the queen is very important. And um, we all age, we know about Data stress, we know about um, um, aging and uh, all of these enzymatic activities that occur by that our bodies are trying to take care of during the aging process. All of those free radicals that we talk about, these also, um, uh, I'm looking right now, I was able to turn and I see a couple of, of questions. So I'm going to address these questions live before I move on. So, how does the Cape honeybee Apis mellifera capensis produce females from unfertilized eggs? And how does this play into queen rearing? So, that's a really good question. It's a completely different um, uh, scenario from the sex determining locus. What they do is that they're able to um, produce clones of the um, haploid individuals. So they don't require a uh, sperm to fertilize an egg. So the egg can basically produce two copies of itself and turns into a diploid um, female. And not only that, those females can actually um, then become what are known as pseudo queens and they can start producing eggs themselves. So very different situation and it's only been observed in Apis mellifera capensis, but it's a big problem because they're called parasitic in that um, they become, it's easy for um, these pseudo queens to become selfish, to want to produce these um, diploid organisms that are not uh, as, as good quality as regular workers are. What determines the allele of a viable drone offspring? Uh, it's all genetic. So if, um, if your mother has allele A or B, the drones can only be A or B. If the queen is AA at the sex determining locus, you know, for whatever reason, if she happened to be homozygous, which is never occurs, but let's say that she was, then all of her offspring would be AA. All Mendelian uh, genetics passing it down from one generation to the next. So you could never have a drone that has an allele D if mom was A, B, you, your drones are only going to be whatever one or of the two that the queen has. And, and so I'm going to see, this seems to argue that a hobbyist with multiple, multiple hives should requeen with queens from different breeders. And would this minimize the chance of poor breeding? And the answer is yes. Um, in many instances. So for a hobbyist, um, this may not be a huge issue because it is very likely that you're buying your queens already made it. So that has solved your issue in terms of mating conditions. You're kind of putting your trust in the queens that you are purchasing and that the queen producer um, is well aware of these inbreeding issues, which they are. Or you're just allowing your um, your queens to mate naturally. And if you live in an area that has some um, uh, rural or suburban areas, it's very likely that you have a good population of feral colonies or unmanaged colonies that can provide a lot of um, genetic material that you're even not aware of. Or um, 
if you live in a semi-urbanized uh, area where there's a lot of hobby beekeepers, you're basically having your colonies mating with the drones from those colonies. So remember, I should have mentioned in case we have all levels of expertise probably in the audience, to avoid this inbreeding problem, which is a huge problem in beekeeping, Apis mellifera has over evolutionary time developed several mating strategies. One is they don't mate inside the hive because then all of the offspring would be um, um, highly inbred and you would have this uh, uh, subroot pattern um, very easily. So the queen mates outside to mate with, to outbreed with other drones. But not only that, Drones mate close to the hive so that they stay, save energy because they're going back and forth every day, all the time, to, to try to mate during the reproductive season anyway. Whereas queens fly further out, um, it's believed to be about a kilometer or so away from the hive, so that they can meet up with uh, drones that are not um, related to them genetically. Because if you may know, this also leads to the issue of during swarming swarms, which of course are daughter colonies of the parental colony, they tend to swarm into areas that are really close to their parental colony, maybe a couple of hundred yards at the, law, at the most. So the queens are kind of bypassing that potential inbreeding uh, situation by um, going out to mate in areas where there should not be any related so let me go back to the issue of the age and the vigor of the queen. So you wanna keep track of your queen's age. Uh, you can either um, label her, we'll talk about that, or no, just note down now with these smartphones and easy photography, you can just document what she looks like, et cetera. And this is one of the reasons why. The queen mates with about 12 to 15 drones on average, depending on the subspecies. Um, this is a famous picture from our, my friend Sue Colby of Spermatica, which is a sperm storing organ of a virgin queen here in the clear fluid and uh, uh, made a queen lay, what she calls a cafe au lait uh, seminal fluid. She removed the uh, tracheal net that keeps that um, um, Spermatica oxygenated. And uh, there was a really cool study about over 10 years ago that showed that the number of sperm cells in the spermatica of queens drops dramatically as the ages. This is a natural kind of um, sequence of events. It's very intuitive because you keep, if, if the book is right that you may lay 2,000 to 3,000 eggs a day, imagine how many eggs that can be per year, let's say almost uh, potentially close to a million eggs a year. So what they did was they reared, they reared uh, a really large number of queens, let's say like 60 queens. They sacrificed them upon mating, uh, just a third of them, and they looked at the number of sperm in the spermatiki. Then they let the rest go and you know flourish. And then whoever survived until the next winter, they took half of those and looked at the sperm um, quantity and the number had dropped by more than half in the one year of queens. Then they let the rest of the queens survive until the next year and whoever or, or went successfully, they took sperm, um, sperm count and they showed that again, the number of sperm cells dropped by a, about another half. So it's basically um, uh, halving of the sperm, uh, the older the queen is. And nowadays we see this problem even more augmented by the fact that these queens are mating with top par drones that may have already lost viability in their sperm even from the get-go, um, pesticide exposure, et cetera, that um, can lead this graph to be even more dramatic. Another thing that's really interesting about queens and as they age is that they the, the sperm that's stored in the spermatica is very neatly coiled up upon um, mating because there's basically no room in the spermatica to store all that sperm. 
um, honeybee sperm is very unique looking. Um, it doesn't look like other sperm. Um, if you've seen, you know, photos of, of sperm that have really big head capsule and a short uh, wiggly tail. This is what honeybee sperm looks like. It's basically like a long piece of thread that under the scope shows a very a, a, a slightly highlighted bolded tip, which is the head. So you don't have that contrast of a big head and a tiny short um, wiggly tail. These are basically like long pieces of thread, really incredibly long tail that is coiled up um, upon uh, copulation. And that same study looked at the motility of the sperm and they showed that it moves in circles. And as you can see the picture, the sperm is coiled up. And then as the, um, the queen ages, she's used up, you know, half of the sperm within a year. That means that there's a lot more room, twice as much room in the spermatica for the sperm to hang out. And they also, because of aging, they distend. And so now they're not coiled up, they're distended, elongated, and they move sideways, almost like in a wave looking motion instead of circles. So they um, also recorded the uh, motility of the sperm in the spermatica, and they showed that there's a reduction of about 40% in the speed of the sperm uh, within a couple of years. So aging affects all of us, including uh, the remnants of the drone, which is the, um, the sperm because of oxidative stress. So that's why you have to keep track of the age and vigor of your queen. So do you have your queen labeled? Do you have records? Um, I'm gonna go now to print the Q and A to see if I am looking at the right question. This one's gone. This one's gone. If a queen is reared by a colony at a time when there are few or no drones to switch to mate, will the colony reject her? And will some workers start laying? Can she survive the winter? And that's a really good question. If if, if I give you an answer saying that um, that indeed um, she um, will get rejected, she may not. <laughs> so there's always exceptions to the rule. But the, uh, the answer is in general, yes. So studies have shown that, um, so the chemical composition of a queen's mandibular gland guest cells, including the pheromones, all the compounds that they produce in these glands to communicate with nest mates, they are considered an, an honest signal of the queen's reproductive quality. Um, poor queens have an off smell that the sending workers, the queen's retinue workers, don't like, and that has severe downstream um, implications, including poor tending of the queen, um, less um, ability for the nurse bees to spread all of these uh, pheromones to the periphery to all of the other workers in the colony, and they feed her less, etc. So when the queen smells differently than normal, uh, she gets rejected, and that's when uh, supercedure or premature replacement occurs. So um, yes, the workers can detect when a queen is failing, and she. Uh, will be failing if what she has is either the production of um, these de deployed drones, which get rejected, they probably they get taken out because of the way they smell. And also, incidentally, has to do with another question here, which is um, the separate pattern. Um, if, if they are doing separate pattern, they, the workers will um, replace her as well. So all of these things, that's why you need to keep track of the genetics of the queen and the age of the queen. Over the decades of queen breeding, have purebred queens like pure Russian, Italian, et cetera, fared better for beekeepers than the more modern breeds like Tassapras, Northern Mutt, et cetera. Are these regionally bred queens the way to go? And the answer is um, purely bred queens, which we call breeders, are actually uh, poor queens. They're very delicate. 
it goes back to the issue of the queen mandibular pheromone. Studies have shown that the uh, chemical composition of queens that are instrumentally inseminated, which would have to be these purely bred uh, queens, uh, to bypass that whole open mating system. Um, they smell very differently than naturally mated queens and the workers don't like that and they replace them really quickly. So what these commercial beekeepers do um, is they try to get as many worker offspring from those queens as possible so that they can graft from them to sell that line of, of queens to the public before the workers replace these breeder queens. They don't last very long. They may last maybe a few months. Um, and of course, the quality of that queen or at least the queen's genetics will depend on who did the breeding program and where you're at. So of course, as you said, locality has a lot to do. How often, uh, so I'll get into requeening later, how often do you recommend? Nowadays, commercial beekeeping operations are requeening almost like prophylactically every year and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, did the study you cited about the effects of drones raised in spring after, was it after full amateur treatment? So we didn't, we treated in the spring because that's when we reared the queens, but it applies to basically any pesticide contaminated wax uh, in, in the case of amitras and repeated exposure to amitras, or in this case, the wax, um, what remains in the wax is it metabolites, the MPF. Um, and then is it best to allow my hive to make its own new queen rather than buy one? And that's a good question that I hope I get to answer um, as we go along. Um, it depends on the, the worker's ability to rear a queen and whether your queen is an emergency queen rearing uh, operation kind of thing or if it's a super seizure queen. Um, you need to keep a birth certificate of sorts for your queen. You need to know when those queens were placed in your colonies. Um, you can use the typical um, color marking uh, technique on the thorax. You can, um, if they've already made it, you can slip uh, the tip of one of the um, wings, just the very tip so that they don't become crippled because if they're wounded, they can also get replaced. But just in case you, they lose their mark, you know that they, they, they are your queen because you've clipped tiny bit of their wing. But nowadays with, with photographs, like if you look at this photo in the middle, she's very dark, right? And you may kind of guesstimate with a ruler, her lens, and she looks very different to the one on the right, which might be also longer in, in length. And so you would already know even if your mark would disappear. But you wanna basically make sure that you are not dealing with the procedure queens or that your colony made it on you. So you want to always try to keep a vigorous queen because otherwise you see these issues. So this is kind of going to your question before, like if you let your queen, your colony requeen the, itself, it depends on the year, the time of the year and the vigor of your colony. If you see cells like this in the middle of the brood nest area, this is absolutely super seizure. Um, if your queen is still there and you may, if you're not a practitioner of key, keeping your queen labeled, might be more difficult for you to know that she's there, although you uh, can play detective and, and locate um, the fact that there's a ton of really young eggs in an area she's probably there. So that would be super seizure, she's still there. But the thing is the workers, have kind of two choices when they're doing their own queen rearing. Sometimes they don't have a choice, but it, in 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 swarming or supersedure, they have a choice of when to start feeding royal jelly to the larvae. During swarming, because there's so much young brood and such a high rate of egg laying by the queen, the workers really have the best options available for rearing queens and they typically rear queens from newly hatched uh, larvae. Um, and that, that's when you see the um, cells in the periphery. So this is kind of like a, 
purpose, purposeful uh, queen rearing operation by the colony. It's the natural instinct for reproduction is the best time to, to produce a queen. When you see this in the middle of the brood nest area, your colony is already having issues. So the workers may not have enough uh, uh, newly had larvae. They may only have um, older larvae because the queen is already failing um, if she's still there. Or you can have the situation of you know, emergency queen rearing where you don't have a queen anymore, in which case the workers only have access to two-day-old worker larvae or, or fertilized larvae to start feeding at royal jelly. And our work has shown that um, the longer the workers start feeding royal jelly for the first time to these developing larvae, the uh, poorer the reproductive quality of that resulting queen will be. Uh, it, can, it can drop by about 20% per day that the workers wait out the royal, uh, royal, royal feeding, royal jelly, oh my goodness, royal jelly feeding to those, um, to those larvae. So, what are the pros and cons? If they feed royal jelly to the first instar larva, which instar means first day, uh, the reproductive quality of the queen is going to be best, highest, when she emerges and mates. But she will take the full 16 days to emerge. Whereas, and so that's waiting out 16 days without a queen uh, and you brood. If they feed, uh, royal jelly for the first time to a second or third instar larva, that means that uh, the reproductive quality of that queen is going to be lower, but they will have saved two or three days. So she will emerge in 13 days, not 16 days, which means that they will uh, hopefully get um, a kickstart in the egg laying sooner. So it's kind of a trade-off, um, which means that it colonies not always know what's best or not always have access to the best possible um, queen or, or at least larvae to make queens. So as I said, queens have uh, several pairs of um, uh, glands on their inside their body that produce uh, several types of pheromones. So they have the deport gland, they have the footprint gland, they have um, the mandibular gland, hypopharyngeal gland, uh, turgo gland. In particular, the uh, mandibular gland, which as the name indicates is right here kind of behind the mandibles, is the one that most of beekeepers know about because uh, there's a blend of at least five chemicals within that gland that comprise what is known as queen mandibular pheromone or QMP. QMP of a really good queen it's like imagine that she is wearing Chanel number no. five, you know, very nice bouquet with beautiful ratios of all sorts of um, chemicals. Highly attractive to uh, nurse age queen. It also inhibits worker ovary activation. Um, so that's why under normal circumstances, when you have um, a very populous and kind of queen right, um, highly functioning colony. You have very few incidences of worker overreactivation because QMP doesn't um, discourage the activation of these few ovarials that some laying workers may have. You can, as we're playing detective, if you see anything like this with several eggs at the bottom of a, or on the sides of a cell, that's not normal, or even if you see only one, but it's off the side, that's an indication that you have laying workers. Um, sometimes um, virgin newly mated queens are kind of getting used to how this egg laying happens, or they might have a short, you know, when their ovary, ovarials are developing, um, they might have a shorter abdomen. So you may see something like this at the beginning. Uh, so give them a couple of days, but if you see this multiple eggs in the cell, that means that um, you have laying workers. QMP inhibits um, worker overreactivation. But we tend to forget or neglect other aspects of the uh, chemical ecology of honeybees. Um, there was a paper that came out a couple of years ago that um, discovered what they called a structurally diverse and functionally redundant cell set of queens. And they found 
basically a new, a novel queen pheromone that works in tandem, uh, synergizes the, um, the effect or the desired outcome of QMP, which is, again, um, inhibiting worker ovary development and, and attracting bees around the retinue. So what they did it for the study is, as I said, for over 20 years, we've known, we've known the five main chemicals that comprise queen mandibular pheromone, but there's other chemicals in the queen mandibular gland. Um, so those are um, the acronyms of which are 9-ODA, 9-HDA, HOB, and HBA. And all four of them, because NHDA has what is called a mirror image of itself or an M tumor, so that's a total of five, those are those that comprise QMP. We know so much about QMP, or at least those five chemicals that for a while we've been able to um, um, purchase synthetic um, versions of these chemicals and give them to queens or to workers to look at how workers um, react to these chemicals in combination, two at a time, three at a time, or five at a time. And so these um, um, scientists, they created these mini colonies and they uh, let them be uh, queenless for some time. And then they started giving them, um, exposing them to either individual QMP chemicals or uh, the large, the, all the QMP chemicals together. Um, or nothing. And so then they scored the activation of the worker ovary. And they found that indeed, just as expected, and we've known for a long time, QMP inhibits worker ovary activation. But what they found is what they call these novel honeybee pheromones are these cuticular esters, cuticular alkenes, and gland esters and acids that had never been identified before. So they have a cuticular um, um, hydrocarbon profile, just like many, most other um, social insects that's unique to queens and also turgo gland chemicals that are almost doing the same thing as um, QMP, which is inhibiting worker ovary activa uh, activation. So the story is becoming even more interesting because there's this synergism between these two completely different glands and their products that help maintain colony function. So that's the paper. I just have it huge right there in front of you in case you um, you want to take a snapshot or something and read it because it's open access, but there's no paywall, and um, it's a really good paper. Has there been any research conducted to look at the effects of all of these different mite treatments on the viability of the queen? And the answer is yes, uh, we did all of that work. So I don't know if I have time to go over um, these, uh, but I can definitely send you all of those papers because uh, we did that with Liz Walsh, who was my PhD student. And we showed basically that queen reproductive quality um, is decreased when queens are developed in wax that's contaminated with the old um, um, mitocytes who valinate in kumafos and nowadays with amitrizes. Does the level of QMP go down when a queen is caged for a few days? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. That's a very good question in terms of like um, how much QMP per unit time she is releasing while caged. Um, it probably is lower because she probably gets this feedback loop where she's releasing QMP, but then she gets it removed from the retinue worker so that they can pass it around. If there's no retinue workers around her, then she has no need to pr produce more because she is not getting that removed from, from the cage. Um, but we do know that virgin queens have um, a significantly different QMP profile than mated queens. So, um, so if the queen remains caged for some time before mating, like in a bank situation, um, her QMP profile is completely different than that of the mated queen. 
Okay. So keep track of your queen and her vigor. In terms of pesticides, oh, yeah, actually, so I am mentioning this. You kind of um, touched a really good point that I was going to bring up, which is that queens, queens can get exposed to pesticides directly and indirectly. Directly, um, if they are reared on wax that's contaminated with pesticides, um, or indirectly, if they get um, exposed to workers that went out to flowers and they inadvertently, you know, encounter pesticides while foraging and they bring back pollen and nectar that's contaminated, potentially the bee bread that's contaminated with these chemicals ends up um, being used by nurse bees that then produce the royal jelly that the queen uh, is fed. In terms of the direct effect, this is one of the like five studies that we have on this topic. Uh, which is that um, queen pheromone and reproductive behavior are affected by pesticide exposure during development. So this one does have a paywall, but I can send you um, all of those papers if you email me later. In terms of parasites and, and pathogens, queens can also get um, varroa destructor, um, either because the colony is incredibly highly infested with varroa and uh, lucky varroa may make it inside the queen cell before it is capped uh, and then can reproduce on, um, on varroa, uh, on the queen, or they can actually get um, parasitized by varroa uh, during copulation. There have been some uh, reports of um, the movement of varroa um, from drones to queens, so it's almost like a horizontal, uh, horizontal movement from drones to queens, but there's also a horizontal transmission of varroa vectored viruses, including the form wing virus, vaccine cell virus, and others. So um, basically what would constitute a sexually transmitted disease. They can also get other diseases um, uh, like black queen cell virus, whereby the larvae um, end up being oily um, on their bodies and, and, and you, they fail to emerge and you will find these oily looking black queens inside, indicative of, of queen, black queen cell virus. And this picture here, which is a very sad um, looking picture of a queen that was parasitized by varroa during development and it actually has high levels of deformed wing virus. So she probably got replaced right away. Varroa, uh, sorry, queens can also get um, sick with Nozema. So both Nozema apis and Nozema serrana, which are the microsporidia gut pathogens. Although nowadays we don't find um, as many instances of Nozema apis in the US um, as there used to be. Um, and I was looking for studies on the effects of Nozema on queens. There's actually just the one that showed that infection with Nozema serrana actually does cause some pathological effects on queens. It, um, so what they did was, of course, they had control queens that were not infected with Nozema, and then they uh, fed the spore-containing food to these queens, and they um, measured all kinds of things. So they looked at um, the um, fat body tissue, the amount of fat body tissue. They, they found no significant difference between control and Nozema infected bees. Interestingly, they found higher titers, incredibly much higher titers of vitellogenin, which is kind of the egg yolk protein in queens that were infected with Nozema, potentially as a um, kind of an immune response. And they found higher antioxidative um, activity in queens that were infected with Nozema, again, trying to combat the pathogen, which is probably has severe counterproducing uh, or counteracting effects, you know, in terms of productivity, because the body is fighting this pathogen and spending energy doing so. But something that was really interesting, though, 
at least for me, based on all the stuff I told you about chemical profiles, is that the ratios of QMP related chemicals like 9ODA, 9HDA, and HOB are completely different in queens that are infected with nosema. Uh, in the case of 9ODA and 9HDA, nosema infected queens have significantly higher levels of those chemicals compared to control queens. In the case of HOB, is the opposite pattern, significantly lower levels of HOB in nosema infected queens. What does this mean at the end? Because the queen is not producing one chemical, but several of them, um, the smell, the, the final gestalt and um, uh, uh, bouquet of, of smells completely different than a normal smell, and it throws off the worker. It has all of those downstream effects that are already produced. In terms of nutrition, nutrition obviously affects uh, queen quality, um, but there haven't been a whole lot of studies looking at, um, at uh, how feeding by queens um, affect their egg laying capacity. There was one study that was published 2000 and I believe this was 17. So it's quite recent, 2019 by Julia Fine, who's a USDA scientist in California. She used to work with um, Dr. Jean Robinson at the University of Illinois. And they came out with a laboratory system for um, for queen tracking. So the purpose of that study was twofold. One was um, testing out these little mini cages that they called mini colonies, or no, they call it micro colonies. So you put a bunch of workers in these micro colonies, and they, you have these um, plexiglass looking um, hexagonal cells like foam, basically, and that allows the queen um, gives the queen space to lay eggs. And all of these little Eppendorf tubes are different types of feeders and water feeders. And it allows for you to very carefully track egg laying behavior of the queen. Um, and there's some that have um, more gadgets and things. Um, and so they were testing out two different, three different styles. But so that wasn't just. I mean, they were trying to test it, and so how they tested it is what the biologically interesting results. They fed um, queens three different diets. One was um, bee bread, uh, regular bee bread. The other one is frozen bee bread, so they had frozen it for a little bit. And the other one was a pollen patty, so blue, red, and green. And they fed them in these micro colonies, the different diets, protein diets in particular, and they wanted to see um, how much food was eaten, which um, the pollen patty was preferred um, than compared to the bee bread and the frozen bee bread one. But the um, size of the hypopharyngeal glands was significantly higher for the frozen bee bread and the regular bee bread diet, which means the um, hypopharyngeal glands, if you know that's uh, what produces brood food, it's better to eat the real deal in terms of the size of the hypopharyngeal glands. But what they also showed was that the work, the number of eggs laid by the queen that was fed those diets was much, much higher than the number of eggs that were um, laid when they were fed the artificial diet. So, being said, the real deal causes things to lay a significantly higher number of eggs, which again has huge implications downstream for colony population size. I'm going to look at questions here. Does a queen that has been banked lose her pheromone profile? Um, no, she doesn't lose the pheromone profile, but I mean, because she's getting in those cages, she's getting fed through the cage. So as long as she's alive, she'll have the chemicals needed to produce pheromones. Um, the composition may change over time 
Um, and so that might cause the workers to not like it very much, but she's not gonna lose that chemical profile. She can change the composition, but not the fact that she releases the pheromones. My apiary is in that location where there are many other beekeepers. How important is it that I set up a drone colony away from my queen colony? I don't think it's that terrible, especially if you're a hobbyist, if you're saying you have a lot of local beekeepers, because then your queens are mating with colonies that are outbred from yours, unless what you're trying to say is that you would prefer that your queens didn't mate with those drones because they are of unwanted genetic strains, like let's say Africanized, you know, like where we live and you don't like African, Africanized bees, then, then you're having one drone source colony a kilometer away from where your colony is, is not going to make or break your queen quality. Um, that's a, something that I would leave up to the more um, middle scale queen producers that can actually afford to have several hundreds of drone source colonies um, to provide these specific genetics. So as long as you have, you're aware that there are bees around uh, that are not your bees, or that at least don't come from the same apiary, then I think you should be okay in, ter in terms of avoiding inbreeding. How long can you bank queens? I have heard talks where they talked over they banked over the winter in the cold northern regions. Isn't winter a form of banking? Thank you. And so you're right. I mean, banking is kind of a sort of banking, but you're doing it only for one queen. So to Kobe, who raises queens, you know, professionally, she says that because of what he does, which is doing instrumental inseminations for a lot of um, breeding programs and research programs, he can bank queens for weeks but she does not recommend it. She says that maybe at most a week is what you should be uh, banking queens for because of the other things we said, you know, pheromonal profiles may change. Um, they, their ovarials get pretty much like obstructed because they haven't been able to produce um, eggs properly. Uh, I guess I'm talking about banking mated queens if they're not mated and are virgin and have not had a chance to mate, you can actually um, disrupt their mating altogether if you bank them for too long after a couple of weeks, uh, they may no longer have the drive for mating and they will never mate. And so they will ne they'll, they'll be buds that never made it. But in the case, let's say of mated queens are banked, workers will get annoyed at these banked queens some more than others, probably because of the pheromonal profile, and they start suing their tarsal glands. Tarsal glands, they're tarsi. Tarsal gland, tarsis. They're tarsi uh, for plural, they, the pads at the bottom. And so if you have a little, um, you know, um, magnifying glass and you're banking queens, you will see some of them, they have no feet. Let's say they don't have the the cloth uh, that they use to hold on to stuff, and those queens typically get replaced. So you don't want to bank them for very long. To minimize the effects of pesticides on queen rearing, do we know how the use of artificial wax foundation affects queen rearing? Um, I don't know that anyone has looked at that. Um, that's a good question. Um, I've actually had a question regarding that for the a company that has artificial wax, like Better Be, have they looked at, you know, what's gonna happen with some of that product may get incorporated with real wax, but those products have been, have not been around for very long and no one has looked at that to my knowledge. I had a queen in an observation hive with a Varroa, which clung to the top of her thorax. The Varroa apparently died because it turned black, but it, it was still attached to her after four months. So workers usually keep her up clear from, I guess, keep queens clean from her uh, You know, these flukes happen all the time. We had the same issue with another queen in our colony and um, maybe the, um, the varroa gets masked with queen reduced pheromone um, and then it's no longer considered 
you know, a, a foreign object. Um, so that might be a colony that's not very good at grooming. How much migration actually occurs on the queen and what effects does it have on the fat body? So I don't know how often this is. It's very rare to find varroa in queens. It's more and more common when you have very high incidences of varroa, but I don't know that anyone has quantitatively looked at that. She's still laying well, by the way, that's great. Um, and queen's ovaries have shrunk from not laying. Are they pheromones affected? And so yes, again, all of these things, changes in behavior, caging, um, aging, all of these things will change her pheromone profile, which in turn affects how she is um, perceived by the workers. Um, what is the queen's normal diet? Well, if she's developing, she is being fed royal jelly by nurses during larval development. Uh, when they emerge, they actually get fed most of the time. They get fed, fed by retinue workers that produce food from hypopharyngeal mandibular glands and a little bit of mix of uh, bee bread in it. I don't understand the purpose to feed out queen bee bread knowingly. They only eat royal jelly. They would be processed by the nurses. Yeah. So I guess I, I was, I confused you because these micro colonies not only have a queen, she would probably not survive on her own. In these micro colonies, they have workers that tend to the queen are being fed those foods um, that um, in turn feed the queen, and that's the resulting egg laying pattern of the queen. We're kind of going a little over. Um, but these, these go by fast because they're kind of the same uh, things that affect colonies like habitat fragmentation, climate change, urbanization, um, threaten not just the colony, but it can affect um, the quality of the nutrition that the queen is getting. Um, so there have been a few, a, a few studies that have shown that urbanization increases pathogen pressure um, on feral and managed honeybees. They have higher levels of certain pathogens, not all of them necessarily, but managed colonies um, may have higher levels of things like Nozema apis or sac root uh, virus and um, uh, chronic bee paralysis virus, things that, that basically will also affect the queen's health and she might be um, infected with those uh, viruses. In terms of climate changing, um, uh, climate change and changing erratic weather patterns, um, you can have several things that are caused by, by climate change that affect um, how bees feed um, on, on plants. This is a very cool program by NASA called Honeybee Net that is kind of like a citizen science program whereby um, people can um, report, self-report where they're located and different uh, plants are blooming at a specific time of year um, throughout the year, especially bee pollinated plants or, or food, bee, plants are consumed by bees for nutrition. And they have shown shifts in the phenology of, of a lot of bee um, consumed plants due to changing weather patterns. So some are blooming earlier in the year, some are blooming later in the year than normal, some are blooming at higher or lower latitudes than other than normal, which basically changes the whole landscape, nutritional landscape of bees across the year. All the things that, um, that may affect queens um, is developmental time based on temperature. So I've done a couple of experiments with queens where you know, queens are supposed to emerge on day 16, um, and they were actually coming out on day, if, if they weren't dead, some of them survived and they emerged on day 18. And it was because there were very low temperatures overnight in, um, after the larvae were capped in the mating nuke. So thermal regulation was an issue in, in colonies um, um, overnight, very low temperatures. 
unusually low temperatures for that time of year, which caused a delay in the developmental time of things. This study by Marla Spivak, which um, she was very surprised one day when I gave a similar talk that I was mentioning the study because she says it was the first time that she had ever seen anyone talk about this study, it's one of those obscure ones. She did look at the soil developmental time of, of queens of a black line and a yellow line uh, when they increased or decreased um, the temperature um, by two degrees, 30 degrees, 33 degrees, and 35 degrees Celsius. And they saw a significant um, increase, uh, sorry, decrease in developmental time for all of the lines um, as, as uh, temperature increased. So <clears throat> that doesn't have, that has probably a lot of implications for the time that, the normal time that it should take for these queens to, um, to develop. So having a shorter amount of time may not allow them to develop properly or large enough or, or um, have enough time to uh, get all of their kind of their organs completely mature before they emerge from adults. And finally, you know, our own beekeeping practices are causing us to, to uh, potentially lose queens unknowingly. So you have to be paying attention to whether your colonies are preparing to supersede their queen. So you need to know if your queen is there, why is she getting superseding? For instance, if you see something like this, where you have an area where you should have worker brood, only worker brood because all of this is worker comb, not drone comb. And yet in areas where you should only see worker brood, you see drone brood, that may mean that your queen ran out of sperm and she became a drone laying queen because she is no longer able to fertilize eggs. What's going to happen to that queen? She's going to get replaced if she didn't already. It might already be too late, but if you start seeing those signs, you know that you have to do something about your queen. So what if the queen is not there, you know, but you're seeing all of these patterns Then you need to know, you know, if you see these cells, this exit hole, and a lot of exit holes, this means that, um, you had an, a super procedure event or an emergency queen rearing event. How long was your colony queenless for, if at all? Had you not paid attention for eggs? Um, are you the type of beekeeper that only goes into your hives every month or two months? And this could happen, you know? It's not going to happen every time, but you may have issues with uh, poor queens and then uh, your colony superseded the queen or you lost the queen and you didn't even notice. And if you see something like this, where again, you have laying workers, your colony may have become even what is known as hopelessly queenless. Um, and if you see something that looks like this with almost every cell having multiple um, eggs, then your colony is not only queenless, is what we call hopelessly queenless, very difficult to requeen these colonies because the majority of your workers are um, have activated their ovaries and are becoming rogues. So why not just let these worker colonies um, thrive? You know, I mean, at least they're producing drones. So these drones are coming from these workers. Wouldn't you just want to produce a bunch of drones that way in your hive? Well, maybe not. Probably not because the firm the traits of sperm from drones that come from laying worker colonies is much, much lower or are much, much lower. The traits, the quality of those drones is much significantly lower. So what they did is, again, they took drones from queen right colonies and drones from laying worker colonies and they weighed them. They looked at the volume of their ejaculate, the number of sperm per unit volume, the concentration of sperm and uh, the number of sperm per milligram of body mass. 
and they showed that for every aspect that they looked at. Drones from laying worker colonies are basically worse at everything. They're smaller, they produce less sperm, the sperm is less concentrated. And so you probably don't want your colonies to become hopelessly queenless just for the production of drones. It's not a good idea. You, have, you want a queen right colony and purposely including drone combing those colonies so that they produce healthy drones that are gonna be much larger. So this kind of takes us to the part where it looks like it might be advantageous to requeen your colony every one to two years because of all the issues we're seeing with um, more and more um, um, higher chances of, re of um, queen failure or queen um, uh, running out of sperm prematurely. So, a young productive queen translates into populous colonies and higher honey production. Colonies that are headed by first year or maybe up to two year queens are less prone to swarming. Failed requeening attempts of older queens will halt your colony buildup. If you if the work if you allow the workers to try to requeen an older queen, say like two and a half or three year old queen. If they fail to requeen, in any case, spring requeening failure endangers your honey flow in the spring because you're gonna have a break in your brood cycle. Fall requeening failure will endanger your overwintering success. It's not good to have a queen that, uh, a colony that's queenless. And the, co the longer that a colony is queenless, the harder it is to requeen later on and like, Hopelessly queenless situations are really bad. And, and so you don't wanna kind of leave it to the workers to decide, you wanna be proactive. And so to be proactive in, in avoiding um, catastrophes in your apiaries with either queenlessness or poor queen quality, again, you have to take care of all of these essentials um, to be a successful and fruitful beekeeper. And the more you know, I mean, there's always going to be problems or um, accidents and environmental things that you can't avoid. But the more you know about your system, the less, the fewer surprises you're going to get. So, with that in mind, we have a queen rearing workshop in my lab um, every year, kind of at the end of, of May, beginning of June. This year, we had the fortune of hosting Sue Kobe, um, um, Melanie Kirby from Zia Queens, New Mexico, Megan Mahoney, who is a queen producer here in Texas, um, Dr. Jennifer Ceruta from University of Tennessee, and all of my lab, um, um, my lab members. It's a very popular program. I have Laying worker colonies produce more mites. Um, well, they don't produce more mites, or let's say there can be a higher incidence of mites. And that's true because our rod structure prefers to parasitize drone brood because they have a longer um, pupation time, which means that the reproductive output of the varroa uh, mites that parasitize that cell is higher. So they will have basically more babies per cell, the more drone cells there are in the colony. But that's also true for colonies that may have a lot of drones because you have a drone laying queen. If you observe multiple queen cups in one, in one's over winter colony in the spring, do you recommend cutting those out? Calling cells is a way of form prevention, but it depends on your needs in the colony. So if you, are a small cell beekeeper and you want to split a colony, the easiest way for you, instead of doing any kind of weird, you know, more convoluted queen rearing, is to allow for the bees to do their own queen rearing, which might be to use one of those form cells. So you might just transfer that cell that has the queen cell into your split. So it, it always depends on what you want to do with your bees. But if you want to keep, maintain that queen because she is an awesome queen, then yes, it might be better to um, get rid of that queen cell. 
when you requeen a colony, can you just introduce a new queen quickly or do you need to introduce them in a queen cage? You have to introduce them caged because the workers otherwise are not used to her pheromone profile and they will kill her. They will bowl her and they will kill her. Um, even two or three days after, they may not like her and they might still bowl her, but your chances are much higher if you um, either plug it with a plug and come back two days later and, and, and cage her, or you can do the direct release method of having a candy plug so that she and the workers get rid of the candy little by little and then she emerges and she gets accepted by the workers without complications. I have a top bar hive and they develop more drone comb than Langstrom hive. I usually try to relocate the drone comb to a different area. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're using top bar, I'm not a very familiar with top bar, but if they produce more drones, then it depends on what you want to do with the drones, right? If you want drones, then it's a good idea. If it's for, if you don't like rural con um, in, in your drone cells, then you might want to do something about it, but the alternative is to use drone comb as a trap for Varroa. So if you're doing that technique, uh, which a lot of people using top bars don't like to, to use chemicals, then that's your your chance. Have I used pushing cages for introducing queens? Yes, and they're very good actually, because the bee, the queen has more space than a regular cage. So our pushing cages are about this big, and that means that she has a lot more space to start laying eggs and kind of get started instead of being in a plastic um, cage or a Benton cage. Anyone doing feral queen research? Um, well, no, I mean, we are doing feral colony research and all those colonies have queens, but in terms of looking at the queens within feral hives, it's very difficult because most people studying feral colonies can only sample bees from the outside of the hive because we don't want to get, we don't want to destroy the tree cavity. We like feral bees and we like the fact that they're unmanaged in those tree cavities. So we sample, let's say the queen's genetics at least by proxy of the workers. What about introducing new queens via queen cells? Again, you can do that. Um, um, absolutely. I mean, uh, queen producers sell queen cells much cheaper than queens, uh, than queens. So queen cells are cheaper than virgin queens, cheaper than um, mated queens. Because it takes longer for each step of the way. And it, and they're also selling you the assurance that the queen actually did make it to that state. So you, you lose queens along each step of the way in queen rearing. Um, so using Queen cells is a way to requeen, but it's not guaranteed that uh, the queen will emerge from that cell, which might mean that you need a couple of backups, not just the one cell, to be sure. How, if you are going to requeen, how long do you wait to add a cage queen after removing the old queen? At least one day to allow for the QMP of the old queen to go away. Um, and potentially two days. But if you're gonna wait two days, you might need to make sure that they haven't started queen rearing on their own. So watch out for any um, queen cups. That was a lot of information. Yes, Michael. <laughs> My talks tend to be really long and full of info. I'm very surprised that all, almost all of you are still present. I see 104 participants. I would have expected maybe 10 of you to be left. Why did the queen lose her tarsa and thereby her foot pheromone? Um, because the workers removed them with the mandibles. They don't like them, so they bite them. They're aggressive toward the queen. And that's it. All right. Thanks, well, right? Thank you very much. Okay, no problem. Thank you guys. Happy holidays. Thanks. Take care. Bye.